So this afternoon, we'll be talking about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent. And so, what are the three functional uses of the NSAIDs? One, yes, antipyretic. What does that mean? Fever reduction. Fever reduction. Let's I am sure you all will recall in Luke 4, when Jesus left the synagogue and he went into Peter's mother-in-law's house. He found her having what? What did he discover she has? Do you still remember the story? High fever, right? And what did he do? He moved close to her and he healed her. The drugs we'll be talking about today will technically bring relief for the treatment of fever, of pain, and of inflammation. But it's noteworthy that Jesus is the one that brings healing. Okay? So as we go through this class today, I want you to see the role these drugs play in relieving fever, pain, and inflammation. But at the bottom of all of this, let's get our minds focused upon Christ. Question number one. Okay. So this is very good. So um, let's go to Sean. What option did you pick? Naproxen. Why did you pick naproxen? It's indicated for primary dysmenorrhea. Okay, naproxen is indicated for primary dysmenorrhea. What is primary dysmenorrhea? Laura. Uh, cramps during menstruation. Okay. So the pain that is associated with cramps during menstruation can be relieved by mostly NSAIDs. And one key NSAID will be naproxen, right? Now, doxycycline belongs to which class of agent? Dr. Ebanga? Antibiotics. What class? Tetracyclines, is that all right with us? So don't start managing menstrual pain with doxycycline, okay? Mylanta, what is it? Dr. Wooda? Sorry? Yes, that is right. It's not right. Yeah. yeah. I would like to pass this one to Joel. Okay, Dr. Sweeney. It's a combination of multiple ingredients, um, like heartburn, indigestion, okay. and stomach. Okay, so don't ever assume that menstrual cramps is just indigestion, okay? Treat it well with naproxen, okay? Any question on this? If you look at the case, she's not presenting with an active GI bleeding or anything that will have made naproxen a little bit contraindicated. She has no history of that. So that would be one of the best agents you will apply. Okay, question number two. The poll is open.
closing in three, two, one. Okay, Kalista, which one did you pick? I chose B, and it is uh, COX-1 and COX-2. Okay, it inhibits COX-1 and COX-2. So, if you look at this mechanism, which of the following COX is constitutively present? Let me go back online. Oren. COX-1, okay? So, and COX-2 is inducible, which means other growth factors and other cytokines can trigger the release of COX-2. So this agent, it's a reversible inhibitor of both COX-1 and COX-2. Is that okay with everybody? Which agent binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit that we saw in the last question? Taylor. Tetracyclines. Okay, the tetracyclines. Is that clear to everybody? So this agent, you recall from your arachidonic acid synthesis, you have the COX-1 pathway and the COX-2 signaling pathway. Most NSAIDs, except for a few of them, tend to inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. Okay, any question on that? All right, next question. Very good. So, Rachel, Dr. T, which one did you pick? I chose C. Why did you go for C? So something that we can see with the NSAIDs because they do not target COX-1 or COX-2 is sometimes we see like GI symptoms. So switching to like a COX-2 selective agent would help this patient. Okay. Uh, let's see those that are online. JJ, which one did you pick? So I think C. Okay, do we all agree on that? So this patient is actually taking ibuprofen 800 milligrams TID, okay? Naturally, you don't want this patient to continue the ibuprofen, am I right? Especially that this patient is already presenting with GI irritations. So you want to change to something. So in this case, our best choice will now be look for a different agent because we do know that COX-1 has to do mostly with the GI lining. Am I right? And the destruction of that can lead to GI irritation and GI bleed. But if you are switching, you pick the one with COX-2 inhibition. That that drug in particular will now help prevent the GI irritation and the bleeding that you see with most non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. JJ told us the trade name for celecoxib. What is that trade name? Mason? Okay, Celebrex. Okay, very good. Any question on this? Online, any question? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, my question is if this patient is allergic to sulfur, because I know the brain causes the sulfur like reaction, but 
Abby, you're breaking up. Okay, Abigail's question is, assuming this patient, in addition to this, is also presenting with sulfur allergy, what alternative should we go for? What alternative can we use? Yes. I'd say perhaps meloxicam. Okay, very good. So meloxicam should come to mind. It is true that meloxicam can inhibit COX-1, but at a very little affinity. It has little affinity for COX-1, but more for COX-2. So your option, if this patient presents with sulfur allergy, is to begin to think of meloxicam. And meloxicam falls under which class of agent? Alethia. What is the class of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent that meloxicam belongs to? I don't remember the name. OK, very good. Who remembers the name? OK, Travis. Enolic acid. What other name? Can you remember? Yes, Taylor. This is just a guess, but the oxycams. Okay, the oxycams. It's a lot easy to remember too. What other agent falls under the oxycams? Uh, let's see. Some T. Uh, okay, peroxicam. Okay, feldine or other names that we have. Abigail, are you okay with your question? Okay, very good. Any question? All right, next question. I will expect 100% with this thing. <laughs> right? Yeah, got it. I got it. Thank you. Closing. Three, two, one. Okay. Not a hundred percent perfect, perfect, but we're almost there. Uh, let's go online first. Okay. Yvette, which one did you pick? Are you really sure? Okay. okay, so we do agree as a class that celecoxib is a COX-2 inhibitor. Is that right? If you pick COX-1 by any chance, which I have seen, please note from this afternoon that celebrates is mostly a COX-2 inhibitor. Celebrates has little COX-1 activity. That's why option C will be incorrect. Okay? And this agent is not a GABA inhibitor. In most cases, we try to potentiate GABA transmission not to inhibit, right? And that's how you find some of the other agents that you'll be dealing with in neuroscience will do for pain. 
it's because they tend to potentiate GABA transmission. Okay. So this agent is not an irreversible inhibitor of COX-1. So remember, selicoxib is a COX-2 inhibitor. Okay. Any question on that? All right. Next question. Jordan. Which of these NSAIDs would induce the greatest <coughs> risk of bleeding in a patient on chronic warfarin therapy? Um, I feel like anyone that was an aspirin. Okay, so you think A is a structure of aspirin? Okay. Chelsea, what you got? Remember, guys, you need to have your cameras on. So, Chelsea, Renee, Jessica. Erica, what did you pick? Erica. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was not I'm sorry. Which one did you choose? have a hundred percent so who chose something other than a you want to have <laughs> Andy no, I, I was just excited to see who did <laughs> so if if drug a is a structure of aspirin what's an, what's the chemical name for aspirin okay acetyl salicylic acid okay so that's drug a Make sure you, you can identify this structure, okay? So if A is aspirin, why does it induce the greatest risk of bleeding on a in a patient that's anticoagulated on warfarin? What mechanism accounts for that effect? Yes, Matt. So the aspirins specifically have an antiplatelet effect. So while it's different than using like one of the clopids or um, uh, ticlopidine or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, it'll still have a permanent effect on platelets where they need to be replaced before you can stop the bleeding risk. Okay, so in summary, aspirin is an anti-platelet, so it prevents platelet aggregation, okay, it interferes with clotting, and what's warfarin? Vitamin K antagonist. A vitamin K antagonist mechanism of action. Yes, Sean? Stop, troops have a marathon. Okay. And what does it do? Why is it used? In what scenario? I'm looking for one word. It starts with an A. Who wants to buy a vowel? It's an anticoagulant, okay? So mixing an anticoagulant with an antiplatelet, in this case, aspirin, is going to potentiate that effect, okay? So we're gonna see the increased risk of bleeding in those patients. So you need to be aware of that. Anybody recognize the structure of drug B? Abby? No, Woodard? No, oh, I thought you were. That was not <laughs> hand raised. That was like, what could it possibly be? <laughs> I'm sorry. Drug B, Nivo. Is it uh, celecoxib? Bingo. What was the giveaway there? It has the sulfonamide in it. That sulfonamide group right here, okay? So this is celecoxib, drug C. If you don't recognize the individual drug, you can tell me the class that it belongs to. Drug C. Any takers online, Chrissy? Jessica? No? Um, I know that it's, um, I think, an acetic acid. I know there's an acetic acid derivative in it, but I, I forgot what drug, what drug it belongs to. Oh, I'll take it. I'll take it. So this is our acetic acid, okay? So it's an acetic acid derivative. So this is actually indomethacin, okay? What about drug D? Ibuprofen. 
ibuprofen, okay? Great. Next question. Waiting for one. All right, closing in three, two, one. All right, so we did not meet the threshold on this one. So I'm going to ask the onliners to discuss among yourselves and then the ones in class, and then I'll reopen the poll, okay? You can use the chat among yourselves. I've muted the screen so they can't see what you're choosing. Yes? I can't hear you, Aluchi. No, just talk among yourselves in the chat. They're using the chat, Aluchi. Okay, closing in three, two, one. I'm so happy because now we're all on the same page, right? So how is aspirin metabolized? Who wants to give me a good summary of that? Okay, Dan, Dan has been trying all morning to answer a question. <laughs> The acetyl group, okay, because what's this functional group, Joel? I was going to say there's an ester there, so the ester would be a good leaving group. Okay. So here is our ester, right? And so our ester is going to be hydrolyzed to what? Okay, we're going to get the phenol right here, and then we're going to get acetic acid, okay? And so we're going to get salicylic acid and acetic acid. I don't know. It's after you do the hydrolysis, that's when you get like the conjugation with sulfates or glucuronic acid, okay? Um, definitely not omega oxidation. We usually see that with alkanes, okay? And of course, if we had a hydroxyl group there, that's when we would expect acetylation, 
So that's not the case. We're doing deacetylation, not acetylation, right? And where is aspirin metabolized? Where does this conversion to salicylic acid and acetic acid take place? Anybody remember? NIBO? It takes place in the plasma, like plasma esterases. Okay, so plasma esterases break down aspirin, okay, into its metabolite. So remember that, so blood and plasma esterases. Any questions online? Clear as mud? All Just right. a follow up to the question on aspirin. What are some of the signs and symptoms of the toxicity seen with the acetyl salicylic acid? Can you remember one? Yes, Jessica. I was going to say tinnitus. Okay, very good. That is one key one that we cannot forget as a class. Okay? Because it will cause significant ringing in the ear. And so, at least if you ask drug history and the patient is on aspirin, it's likely that he has overdosed on aspirin. What are some of the antidote for that? Yes, Ben. Uh, activated charcoal. Okay, activated charcoal. Very good. Very, very good. Please remember some of these things as you step out of this place that at least you can help your patients out there. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Okay, next question. Poll is open. Waiting for one. Closing in three, two, one. Okay, thank you. All right, so. This is an 18-month-old baby that died due to overdose of acetaminophen, right? So what do you think is the likely cause of this uh, patient's death? Let's go to Dr. Anderson. Why did you think liver failure? Okay. Okay. Renee, which one did you pick? Okay. So, overdose with acetaminophen, it's likely going to lead to liver failure or liver damage, right? What is the maximum dose for acetaminophen? Yes. Um, I believe it's 4,000 milligrams, um, but then in patients who tend to be alcoholic, I believe it's 3,000. Okay. So if you have a chronic alcoholic patient, he's almost just going to take half of the dose that the normal individuals will take. Now, I am saying this because I want you to pay attention, especially that acetaminophen is consistently added to Norco, to your hydrocodone and the rest, right? Sometimes it's not because the physicians are, the way they write this, you have to be patient and calculate because it's like one to two, Q3 hours, 
right, or Q4 hours, you have to calculate the amount of acetaminophen total just to make sure that the patient is within the range. And you can go further to ask the question, if the patient is an alcoholic, then you need to step back and call the physician and say, this individual is an alcoholic, and I notice that the amount of acetaminophen that this patient is going to consume it's higher than the regular amount for them, OK? Yes, Laura, you have a question? Um, I did. So if, so we have an 18 month old. Suppose that this child was born with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, would that would we consider that in a situ as a situation similar to how we would treat an alcoholic in this case, or is the or is the patient far enough removed at that point that we wouldn't be concerned about it anymore? Okay, very good question. All right, any thoughts in class? How would you treat this patient? I have no idea, so. <laughs> I want to hear your thoughts. Okay. Yes, Dr. T. So I think you'd still want to be cautious just because it is a neonate, but I don't think it's as much of a concern because I think in our alcoholic patients, you're concerned about like liver damage over time. So like it is still a concern, but not a large concern for your neonate patient. Yes. Dan? Yeah, to add to that, I don't think that the, the infant's um, liver is what was metabolizing the alcohol when the parent was consuming it. So in theory, there wouldn't really be any liver damage. But like Rich said, you would still want to be cautious with neonates. OK. Caleb? Nope, that's good. Oh, <laughs> OK. Yes, Sam G. OK. All right. So. So what Sam is saying uh, is that this is a pediatric patient. The chances are high you won't even get close to 4,000 milligrams in this patient. So, but it all calls for us to be cautious in treating pediatric patients. So what then will you use if a patient is presenting with acetaminophen toxicity? <laughs> oh, this should be pretty easy. Sam is ready to go. This is. Who has not spoken today? Dr. Ballantyne, number two. You said for acetaminophen? Yes. Um, well, just continuing the acetaminophen. Okay. And Is it best to administer activated charcoal or something different? <laughs> Which one do we have in mind? Sam G, you were raising your hand, right? I think for activated charcoal, it's the aspirin. Right, so what will you use for acetaminophen toxicity? Okay, NAC. Okay, N acetylcysteine is best for acetaminophen toxicity. Did you guys all hear me online? OK, very good. Next question. Waiting for two. Okay, slowly. 
thing. Oh, really? Okay, that's good. Jennifer, which one did you pick? Um, I picked C because it can increase the risk of cardiac events. Okay. Um, Travis, which one would you pick? Sam T. Um, I also said C because, um, like Charles said, it increases that risk of MI and stroke. And it doesn't do anything to the stomach, so you wouldn't have to worry about having more risk. Okay, so what Sam T is telling us in class is that option D should be ruled out immediately we see this question. Is that right? Okay, so if we do agree, then we only have options A, B, and C. And the rationale for ruling out D is because celecoxib, is that right? Yeah, celecoxib has nothing to do with COX-1, right? But mostly COX-2. History of alcohol abuse will be key in what's in patients taking which of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. Hannah, history of alcohol abuse will be key in what kind of patients taking which of the following NSAIDs. I'm probably going to have to. Okay, naproxen, acetaminophen, Aspirin and ibuprofen. Uh, okay, acetaminophen. That's key. That's good. Okay. Any question on this? All right. Let's go to the next question then. Poll is open. Closing in three, two, one. I got okay. Uh, let's see those online. Dr. Erica, which one did you pick? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I chose A because there's not an insect. Okay. Uh, Carly, which one did you pick? I also chose A. Why did you choose A? Because a CMN pen is analgesic, antipyretic, but not anti-inflammatory. Okay, so let's pause for a moment. This is one agent that lacks the anti-inflammatory potentials of the other NSAIDs, right? And so you recall in the beginning we said NSAIDs are good for three uses. One is antipyretic, and Caleb helped us to understand that that is in the management of fevers. This is why. When an individual has a fever and you give any of the NSAIDs, it crashes it down. Now, what is the mechanism for fever development? How do you get fevers? Yes, Ben. Um, build, up of, build up of prostaglandin E2. Okay, the build up of prostaglandin E2. Now, when you have a build up of the prostaglandin E2, 
it now caused a reset of what? Of the thermoregulatory centers in the hypothalamus. Am I right? And because of that reset, you, you are able to, your temperature is able to still go up because it has reset it. Now, NSAIDs, because they inhibit prostaglandin synthesis, they are able to shut down the production, and now you see a decrease in fever. Does that make sense? Now, what is analgesic effect of NSAIDs? What do I mean if I tell you? Oh, it possesses an analgesic effect. Math. Pain relief. Okay, it provides pain relief. So acetaminophen, Tylenol that we all know, only provides relief to fever, relief to pain, but it has nothing in terms of inflammatory process going on. Okay? And that's why the it's commonly used. It's one of the first drugs. Okay, if you have pain or you have fever, oh, take Tylenol, you should be okay. But it, does, it has nothing to do with the inflammatory process. Okay. So naproxen and indomethacin can actually be used in the treatment of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. What is that? A P2 student is coming to you and said, oh yeah, I know you guys just talked about this. You are feeling really cool. You are a P3 student. <laughs> and he says, so what is ankylosing spondylitis? Yes, Christian? It's the narrowing of the spinal, like bone on the nerve. Can you all hear him on this side? Really? OK. You have to say it loud enough. So that the, the guys online can hear you. Speak loud. So I think it's the narrowing of the spine onto the nerves in the spine. Is it really the narrowing of the spine? Yes, Caleb? So the inflammatory processes cause a reduction in the, um, like in the discs between the spine. The spine starts to like fuse together. So Correct. So patients have a lot of back pain, lower back pain primarily. Right. So. You see that the bones in the spine will fuse together. So the little gaps, that's what makes us feel the way we feel. But in this individual, those gaps are actually fused together, so bone to bone. And if this is very progressive, what you find out is that an individual actually will come this way, rather than the regular straight that we have. So, but to relieve the pain because of consistent bending this way because of like the hunchback, then you use NSAID for the management. Does this make sense for us then? Because that way you can reduce the pain and then the inflammatory process going on. Next question. Hold it open. Waiting for one. Closing in three, two, one. Okay. So before I begin to ask, okay, let's let's see what is the option you guys pick. Uh,
Huh? Who? Harley. Harley. Oh, where is she? Oh, what? That's right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Taylor. Taylor gave you up, Harley. Jessica, you kept quiet because that's your friend, right? <laughs> Ekua. <laughs> okay. Do we have someone? I know some people pick different options. Is there someone in class that is thinking something different? Yes. I Jessica. guess like when I was thinking through this question, I didn't know if having to inject yourself was like necessarily an advantage. Like in my mind, being able to swallow pills is like nicer than having to like inject yourself. Okay. But what if the patient cannot take an oral agent? Well, right? then yes, in that situation. But like so for then myself, that's, that's not a like, So it's going to be situation specific, right? So and that brings us to the question. So the right answer to this will be D, OK? But let's pause for a minute. I just want us to understand this, please. Aspirin dosage forms. One, Dr. Wooda, Princess Wooda. Tablets. Tablets, okay, very good. Two, huh? Yes, ma. Chewable tablets. Okay, chewable tablets. <laughs> That's right, okay. Three, yes. Okay, very good. So you can have a rectal insert for aspirin, right? Okay, what else? Yes? They also have enteric-coated tablets, or tablets. Okay, enteric-coated tablets mostly, because we, we as pharmacists have decided that because it affects the GI lining, we just enteric-coat it. And if you recall in your P1 class, that is meant to prevent the GI from breaking the drug. And so it makes a transit into the small GI. So, ketorolac, it's one agent that you cannot forget. The maximum dose, it's not beyond five days. I brought this question up because in one of the days that I was practicing, a physician actually made an error and asked for ketorolac for 21 days. You know, on the drop-down menu, any error can happen. So I was with a pharmacist, and I said, I'm not going to fill this. I need to talk to the physician. She said, oh, this patient must be in severe pain. Just go ahead. I said, no. You can use your license in this case, not mine. <laughs> yeah, you need to protect your license. Am I right? So. We kept going back and forth, and I said, I'm just going to call the physician's office. The, as soon as I placed the call, and he picked the phone, he said, I am truly sorry. I was only going to go for five days. Can you please deactivate that prescription? I am sending another one electronically to you. So just be on the watch out that this is a drug that cannot go beyond five days. Okay? Yes, sir. How long can a patient go without taking a before they can reinitiate uh, Ketorolac? Before they do what? Before they can reinitiate a five day cycle of Ketorolac. Uh, honestly, I think after five days, naturally, these things should resolve. If not, then you may technically go to something different. Yeah. Okay. Next question. The poll is open.
waiting for two, waiting for one. Closing in three, two, one. We haven't met the threshold on this one, so discuss with your neighbors, onliners, chat among yourselves. Have reopened the poll. Closing in three, two, one. All right, it's not unanimous, but I'll take it. So, which of the structural features of aspirin is responsible for the GI troubles in the patient? Travis, you look like you want to answer. <laughs> Never make eye contact. <laughs> you select the carboxylic acid. Abby? <laughs> Online? Jennifer? If that, if, if that helps you remember, whatever helps you remember, okay? Acids are corrosive. Okay, so it is a carboxylic acid, right? This carboxylic acid group. Notice I said conventional aspirin because these issues would be diminished with which dosage form? Don't be bashful. Enteric. The enteric coated. So this is not the enteric coated aspirin that the patient is on. Is on the conventional aspirin, okay, and so we're seeing those GI problems, but it's because of this carboxylic acid functional group, okay? Questions on that? Yes, Nicole. What does it happen again that the carboxylic acid causes destruction? So, it just um, disturbs the stomach lining, and you'll see that with some of the others, but it's more notorious with aspirin. Next question.
closing in three, two, one. Discuss among yourselves. We have online discuss among yourselves. The poll is open when you're ready. still way <laughs> below the threshold, but let's talk through this. So that's good, right? So first of all, I told you these are acetic acid derivatives. So bear that in mind. So Matt, what did you pick? Uh, so I went with C. You went with C. Calista, what did you pick? I chose C because of the double bonded oxygen. I just remembered that from the notes in the contract. So you pick D on account of this? Kate, what did you pick? I picked the problem. Okay. Jessica okay. is different. Um, so I was between C and D because I, I think with C there is like an acetic acid and to be honest, I don't know. I just went with what everyone was saying. D. I don't know. That's my answer. Okay, that's honest. Graham. Sean. Uh, I want to see. All right. Mason. Oh, I go? You chose C too? Okay. okay. So C is not the correct answer. The answer is D, but why D? What are we looking for? Because I had half of the class, roughly 50% choosing C and the other 50 choosing D. So I know that was a struggle. So why is D the correct answer? I told you this would be important, right? If you don't remember anything else from this session. They're acetic acid. What does acetic acid look like? Is that the acetic acid? Is that the acetic acid? So this is the sodium salt of the acetic acid, okay? In solution, we would still have the acetic acid, okay? So we would have H there, okay? Sodium salt, what, what does the sodium salt do? Why would we make the sodium salt of this drug? This is diclofenac. 
is diclofenac sodium. Which, Joel? Well, we use it transdermally a lot, like on the skin, so it would be able to penetrate the skin a little bit. Mm. Um, Why would it be Taylor? Okay, hear me out. Um, so <laughs> they make a diclofenac, I think, phosphate as well. So I think it's it has to probably do with people who have like um, sodium or potassium issues or imbalances. But I don't know. Nibo. They have a charge so that it's harder to cross membranes. Uh huh. So like you can't cross into the blood-brain barrier, so it's more peripherally acting. What? Also, it would stay in the tissue. Yeah. Blood, blood. Okay, so now boys telling us the charge on there would make it not able, being not able to traverse membranes. But why would we make the sodium salt, the phosphate salt, potassium salt, the calcium salt, any salt of a drug? Just this is not a trick question. To improve what? Absorption. Huh? Absorbability. To improve what? Solubility. And so salts are more soluble in? Liquid water. water. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love this guy. The salts are more soluble in water. So we make the salts in order to facilitate water solubility, okay? So think about that. So you'll need to make salts for a lot of these drugs if you're gonna use them uh, IV or otherwise, okay? So that's one reason. Is What is this? group here. This is etodolac. That's an acetic acid. Okay? So again, these are acetic acid derivatives. Drug A, we talked about earlier, is indomethacin. Okay? So drug D is nabumetone. Remember, this is a prodrug. What do we have here on the side chain? We have a butanone group. Okay? And that butanone group is going to be oxidized once the patient takes this drug to give us what? Acetic acid. So we're going to chop off all of this, okay, and add that CO2OH group. So it mirrors these once it's taken. So that's why it's a prodrug. Any questions on that? Questions online? Okay. All right, so here I have a slide just showing you how nabumetone is converted to the active metabolite. Okay, so we're going from nabumetone to that acetic acid group, okay? So it's a prodrug. It's not active until after it's taken by the patient, ingested, and then metabolized to the acetic acid, okay? Next question. Closing in three, two, one. Okay, very good. All right, so let's talk about the mechanism. What is the key mechanism of action of leflunomide? Uh, Zachary Wheeler. Okay, where is your 
friends, Graham. Which one did you pick? Why did you pick A? Oh, it's difficult to hear you, jo uh, Graham. I know you are a soft-spoken gentleman. Try to speak out louder. Okay. So do we all agree that A is correct? Okay. In what conditions can we not use this agent? Uh, let's see, who is online? Uh, Jessica Estefan. Yes. Where is your video? Under what conditions are we not going to? Okay. You, you want to avoid the administration of loflunomide in which patients? Um, is it, I think it's the one that you So in pregnancy, this is an agent that we want to avoid, okay? But if a patient has been on it, and they are planning, the family is planning to have a baby, what agent can you help, or what will be your counseling point on which agent they can take if they have been on luflonamide for a while? Samji. Okay, that will help take out this agent. Can you okay. repeat for the ones online? Which is both? Okay, you need mm -hmm. to speak louder. <laughs> you can give them colas here. Okay, can you hear her? Okay, very good. So you give that to the patient, okay? So this is one agent that is contraindicated in pregnancy. And so we need to watch out. And even if a patient is on it and they want to become pregnant, then you stop and start cholesterol treatment. That gets rid of the drug. Yes, sir. Dr. J.L., yeah. can, can you explain the acetic acid? This is the question that we had before. Because on all those molecules, I only saw carboxylic acids. I didn't oh. see acetic acid, unless I'm just misunderstanding like what it is. All right. let's. Draw the structure of acetic acid. Okay, so the this is acetic acid. CH3, okay? COOH. That's acetic acid. So all of these have, because you have a substituent on here, okay, that replace one of the hydrogens. So that CH2OH, that's the acetic acid moiety. Those, that comes directly from acetic acid. So you see that here? Okay. So in acetic acid, this is H. In these molecules, this is R. Okay. So it gets, it gets cleaved at that R group so that molecule becomes the acetic acid? That just these are not converted to acetic acid. They're derivatives or analogs. Okay. Or um, they all contain that acetic acid motif. Okay, thank you. Make sense? Yeah. So you see that here in drug A in the methacin, you see that here, here. But in um, nebumetone, you have to metabolize this drug to reveal that acetic acid, okay? Like I showed you over here. All good? All right, good question. Any other questions? OK. Before we round up in the next few minutes, what are DMATs? What are DMATs? Yes, Caleb? Disease-modifying anti- OK, disease-modifying anti- OK. Why will you prefer them over the non D marks? Mm -mm. 
Kali, I need to hear from you today, really. I definitely already asked questions. Or oh, already question you one, <laughs> But uh, the non DMARDs, I guess in my head, it's the DMARDs will kind of help treat the actual issue, whereas the non DMARDs are just helping with like this, the effects of it. Okay, so let us get this very, very clear. The DMATS will prevent further joint damage, right? While the non DMATS will just help relieve what is actually going on in the process. So example of a non DMAT will include one, a simple one that we have all been hearing since March. Hydroxychloroquine, right? In this case, I'm not talking of hydroxychloroquine in the management of COVID-19. I'm talking of hydroxychloroquine in the management of RA. What must I pay attention to when I place my patient on hydroxychloroquine? No, not you. <laughs> yes, Sean? Uh, you gotta get uh, the Exam. Okay, you need to get an ophthalmic examination. And the reason is because hydroxychloroquine plaquenil gets deposited in the retina. That's why you need to constantly check to make sure that at least you are okay. If not, then they may want to change the prescription for you. Okay, so I just have five more minutes and then class will end. On this side of class, I need three volunteers to tell me exactly what they have learned in class today. Three volunteers from Andy this way. Three volunteers. Yes, Sean, one. Acetaminophen um, only has two out of three properties. What are those properties? Um, it is analgesic. Analgesic. Uh, it is antipyretic. It is not anti-inflammatory. Okay, very good, very good. It's good that you remember. Yes, Andy Valentine, number one. Uh, so, celecoxib is selective for COX two. Okay, yeah. so celecoxib is selective for COX two. It has little or no effect on COX one. Last volunteer. Oh, you guys know I know you by names. <laughs> yes, Dr. Swain. Uh, Oloxicam and Paroxicam can be used when silicoxib is contraindicated because of heart issues, but they're more selective for COX-2. Particularly meloxicam. Please, let's remember, particularly meloxicam. Pyroxicam, too, has a very good COX-1 inhibition. OK, on this side, hold, hold your thoughts. Online, <laughs> Dr. Capo. What have you learned in class? After you, then I will call on Ben Foster. Can you? Oh, they are frozen? Oh, yeah, they are back to life now. OK. All right, so Dr. Capo, what have you learned in class? Okay, very good. Ben Foster. Uh, for treating aspirin overdose, you want to use active charcoal or uh, fluids? Okay, activated charcoal or some fluids. Okay, who else online wants to volunteer? Chelsea, I have not heard from you today. Right. What have you learned? Okay, very good. Okay, on this side of class, what have you learned? Three volunteers. Yes, one. Um, you can use n acetylcysteine as the antidote for Okay, n acetylcysteine for the management of acetaminophen toxicity. Very good. Second volunteer. Naibu. <laughs> I was going to say that 
butanonone, uh, moiety can be converted into acetic acid. And so okay. that makes it a prodrug. Okay. The butanone in nabutanone. Okay. That's good. That's chemistry. Matt. We can take advantage of different salt forms of some of these medications to make sure they work exactly how we want them and where we want them. Okay, very good. So the salt form increases solubility, and that also will technically enhance the bioavailability of that drug. Am I right? Because if the drug is not soluble, then it's, you take it, it hangs in, and then it's gone the way it's gone. This is not like ghost tablets, right? <laughs> you remember ghost tablets? OK. <laughs> yeah, please, I don't want you to see one. I don't believe that. Yeah, OK. All right, any questions for Dr. Sean Bobi and myself from online? I want you guys to remember the pro drugs. That's going to be important moving forward. So we have nab nabumetone. We also have flunamide. Okay, so the active metabolite of that is teriflunamide. Remember that. And then what's the third one? It's also a DMARS, salazine. Okay, that's converted to a um, salicylic acid derivative, which is the active agent, okay? And the side effects that you see with that molecule are due to the other um, product of the hydrolysis, all right? So the three pro drugs are, we talked about today, nabumetone, salazine, and leflunamide, okay? Okay, any questions from online first? Are you guys good? All right, very good.